Thank you, Eileen. And thank you to everybody who's here. Um, thank you very much to the Georgia Municipal Association for having this forum today and for the opportunity to address all of you. Uh, as the political newcomer here, uh, I don't take this for granted, and I'm very grateful to be a part of this process. So, since I have the unique distinction today among your speakers of being the only one who's never previously held elected office, I thought I might use my time in part for you to get to know a little bit about me and about why your organization means so much to me personally. So I grew up in southwest Missouri in a small town. I went to public schools. I'm the proud granddaughter of a public school teacher. Uh, I'm a proud public school parent here now in Cobb County. And that education gave me the springboard to pretty much every opportunity I've had in my life. Um, I ultimately went on to attend Washington and Lee University for undergraduate and made my way to the Harvard Business School where I completed my master's in business administration in 2003. So for the last 15 years, I've really been in the business world. Um, every job I've ever had has really shared a couple of characteristics. Number one, saving and creating thousands of jobs. Number two, I've worked a lot in the capital markets, including with early stage investors and in trying to get small communities of businesses launched. And number three, I've worked a lot with entrepreneurs and starting businesses. And in the course of that time, what I've found is that the political world has increasingly begun to impede on the business world. In the boardroom now, we're addressing issues like healthcare. We're addressing issues like continuing education. We're addressing capital markets, interest rates, bond markets. And as those things have progressed, I have found myself increasingly having to deal with the political in the business world. So for me, um, I, my story is sort of interesting in how I got to a boardroom in the first place. Uh, I, in 2008, my family acquired a small, struggling car hauler. So for those of you who have never seen them before or didn't know what they were called, car hauls are the double-decker trucks you see driving down the highway carrying vehicles. Um, in 2008, at the height of the financial collapse, we bought a company that had about 120 employees, so relatively small in the grand scheme of things. About a year later, we had the opportunity to acquire a competitor who was 10 times our size called Jack Cooper. It was a family-run business that was founded in 1928, and the family who owned it really wanted another family to purchase the business so that they could continue to take care of their people in the way that the Cooper family had for three generations. Uh, we were very fortunate to be able to purchase Jack Cooper in the spring of 2009. Uh, and within a matter of weeks, if not months, both the General Motors and Chrysler bankruptcies occurred. So we found ourselves really as a part of the comeback of the American auto industry, fighting for every job, dealing with issues of pensions, dealing with the Great Recession. And as a part of that, we learned the true resilience of the American worker. I learned a lot about the dignity of those workers. Um, in fact, for those of you who've seen our campaign launch video, there's a gentleman named Cliff who's the driver in the video. He's actually been a driver for 33 years in our industry. Uh, he'll retire this year with 34 years. These are good people, they're hardworking, and they're counting on people like me to make sure that they can have full pension, health, welfare, uh, good quality of living, and a high wage. So that's where I've spent the majority of my time. Um, so that initial 120 employee business is now the largest finished vehicle logistics carrier in North America. I manage a fleet of over 3,000 tractor trailer combinations. We have about 50 terminals in the North American market and probably about 90 locations if you combine all of our ancillary businesses. Uh, we've grown since 2008 from 120 to over 3,000 employees, and we've done that in the absence of private equity. So it's really been a bootstrap Cinderella story. Uh, and what that's taught me is that we're not just in cities. We're in markets that probably look a lot like all of the places where you live and work. Um, we're in places like Arlington, Texas, Fairfax, Kansas. We're in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And we've learned a lot about how to create jobs in those markets as well. So one of the things that concerns me and that brought me into the political world is the uneven nature of economic development in Georgia. And I'd like to talk for a few minutes about what I think is driving that, not as somebody that comes from the political world, but as somebody who's been a job creator for the last 15 years. 
we've got to take a real look at health care and education and whether or not the parties in our government can work together to accomplish the results our voters demand. On the health care side, I'm concerned. You've all seen the statistics. When you have 60 counties without a pediatrician and more than half of the counties without an OBGYN, when you have rural hospitals closing at an alarming rate, it's not just a moral question. This is a question for economic development because those of us who run businesses, those of us who choose where to put the next location for our company know that we can't plant a location where our employees can't take their kids to the doctor. We can't plant a location where our employees can't go to have a baby. These are going to be long-term impediments to economic development, and it's something that I'm absolutely committed to changing as your next lieutenant governor. In addition, I think we have to look at education. As I started to say, this is a passion project for me. My kids are in public schools. I am proud to be a public school graduate, a public school parent. But we've got to recognize what investing in education means. You can't possibly continue to underfund education and expect to produce the world's most competitive workforce 10, 20 years down the line. You can't possibly continue to cut education and expect that the next unicorn company comes out of Georgia. We've got engineering talent coming out of here that will create the jobs and companies and industries that will control our future, whether that's artificial intelligence, fintech, cyber tech, healthcare technology. We've got to keep those students, we've got to keep those graduates, we've got to keep that talent here in Georgia, and we've got to get them creating businesses throughout our state. But to do that, we're going to need a 21st century infrastructure that enables them to plant jobs and businesses in places that aren't just Atlanta. We're going to need local capital to fund that early stage startup culture. We're also going to need, again, a solid education system that continues to invest in the next generation of workers and access to health care so that those of us who spend our lives creating jobs will have healthy and educated workers to fill them. Last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about why your organization matters to me personally. Um, you know, I grew up, in a, as I said, in a rural southwestern Missouri community. I know what it looks like when the last specialist in a practice at a hospital leaves your town. And I know what that looks like when one of your family members now has to drive an hour down the road to get to the next specialist, or two hours to the next hospital who can do that. I understand what that means for the families who aren't just a number or a statistic. These are real families that are now having to travel an hour each way to go to a pediatrician, a couple of hours to get to a nearby hospital or to have a baby. And I just don't think that's something we can accept. My grandfather was a city manager in a little town in St. Louis, Missouri called De Pair. Um, and I understand that local control and local solutions, more importantly, for these issues are going to be key. So I'm hoping we're going to get a Thank chance you. today to talk about how we build those solutions together. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rick. Amico. Ms. Nolan, you have the first question. Hi. Hi, Joe. Um, the only form of government which is currently uh, growing in recent excuse me, in recent years is cityhood, and many elected officials from those new cities are here with us this afternoon. What is your, your opinion on the creation of new cities? Well, I think, you know, first of all, it depends on the area, right? I, I think our communities need to make a lot of these decisions at the local levels. One of the beautiful things about the American system of government is that we've developed this philosophy of laboratories of democracies, whether that's the state within the federal system or certainly local and municipal communities within the state. So in my view, if there are local municipalities who choose to form new cities and can do that in a way that's economically advantageous to their citizens, that's sort of what the American democracy is all about. I've been a big believer in our system of government. I'm a student of that uh, almost lifelong. I believe in American exceptionalism and that this is part of the magic that makes it happen. We don't have government that just happens from the top down. We have these ideas that bubble up from the grassroots and candidly sometimes those are better than what we could get from the top down. Thank you. Well, we set the time. Mr. Provo, you have the next question. There's been a lot of talk about the need to improve infrastructure in rural areas, including high-speed broadband. 
where do you stand on allowing private for-profit telecom companies to have access to public rights of way to expand access to broadband? Yeah, this is something I think, uh, so as a political newcomer, this is something I'm still learning a lot about. And I think it's really important that we engage those local communities as well as the property owners in those discussions. Um, but for me, this is the perfect example of how we need to do a better job of bringing businesses into solving some of the problems that plague our state or some of our communities, particularly in rural Georgia. Um, we've got a great set. Uh, in fact, I think we've got 450 of the five, Fortune 500 companies who have offices in Georgia, and I think it's 17 of them that are headquartered in the Atlanta area. We've got businesses starting throughout this state. Uh, for me, part of what I see missing in the government landscape right now is the appropriate engagement of those businesses in creating solutions to these problems. And, and again, not just from one side, not just from the corporate side and their needs to get things like infrastructure out into the, uh, on the broadband front. I think you also need to bring in companies to look at economic revitalization. We need to look at educational systems. We need to look at smart partnerships to expand access to healthcare. So from my perspective, this is a great place to bring together all of the stakeholders and make a decision that works best for Georgians. It's interesting because in the corporate world, this is just sort of how things work, guys. It, it seems to be somewhat different in politics, but for us, when we approach a massive decision, we're engaging labor, we're engaging investors, we're engaging employees, we're engaging our customers. There's not a single stakeholder that doesn't have a seat at the table in those decisions. And while everyone may not walk away from the table with exactly what they wanted, we all walk away that's uh, with a solution that's infinitely better because we all participated than it would have been if any one entity or stakeholder had made that decision solo. So from my perspective, these are community discussions, they're stakeholder discussions, they should be robust, they should be public, but they should be participative with the business community as well. Thank you. When we set the time, you now have two minutes to give us your closing statement. Right. Well, thanks so much. Um, you know, it's funny. Two questions. I'm grateful to have the opportunity, uh, but it feels like we're just scratching the surface, guys. There, there is so much that we can do here. And what I'd like to offer to everyone in the room today, and I mean it very sincerely, uh, throughout the last 15 years, I've had what I call an open door policy for my team members, for my employees. Anytime they want to come by my office and sit on my couch or have an impromptu conversation, they're always welcome. Uh, and anybody I've ever worked with would tell you the same thing. So what I'd like to extend to you today is an offer to do exactly that. I understand that for many people to see a pro-choice, pro-business, pro-labor Democrat, uh, evangelical at that, is a little bit like watching a unicorn walk across this stage. <laughs> but I, I want to encourage you to think of me as somebody that will work with anyone who's willing to roll up their sleeves and solve a problem. Because again, I don't come from the partisan world. I don't come from politics. I come from a job where every day I am expected to show up and sit down even with people who vehemently disagree with me. And we are expected that even if we disagree 99% of the time, we find the 1% overlap where problem solving gets done and where our stakeholders' needs come first. And that is exactly how government should function. We're here because we've been given a job or we're trying to get a job to be in service to the people of Georgia. That is the highest honor and the absolute magic of our system of government. It is not a responsibility I take lightly, any more so than I take lightly going into a boardroom and del delivering on my fiduciary responsibility to a business. I want to invite you to take me up on this. Come, ask me questions, set calls, have meetings, I'll come to you. Engage me in conversation, challenge me with your hardest questions. Tell me what you need to be successful and how we can accomplish that together. And Thank I will you. listen. Thank you very much Thank for having me. Thank you for me. your remarks. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.